Hello, everyone. Welcome to this introduction on the SCARF management model. My name is Sonia. I am the HR administrator in the Division of Student Life. I am really excited to share the SCARF management model with you today because it's a useful tool, framework, to think about engagement at work. It's useful from the perspective of an employee, from the perspective of a manager, and an organization. I took a certificate in the Foundation of Neuroleadership. It's taught by the Neuroleadership Institute. The faculty were neuroscientists who are gearing this towards practitioners like myself, managers, leaders, who want to look at performance, leadership, organizational practices from, informed by a neuroscience perspective. So basically, the theory of the SCARF model is based on two general principles from neuroscience, which is the organizing principle of the brain is to minimize threat and maximize reward. And the other is that there's a fundamental overlap in the brain, the regions that control survival and social needs. And SCARF is basically an acronym for the um, five different social domains where we experience threat and reward. So here, from a survival perspective, I think we're all quite familiar with survival needs, right? That on a biological basis, you probably find this guy threatening, right? I, I tried to find a threatening looking lion. <laughs> and that we would be designed to avoid this threat, right? You guys have heard of the fight flight model, run, fight, whatever you can do. And then food, rewarding, right? That we're designed to move towards that which is rewarding, and our brains are designed to find food rewarding. So, what may not make sense, or which is interesting, is that the very same mechanisms that govern that sense of the lion, you could be experiencing the same physiological reactions to this guy. It depends on how bad he is. And that you would also find this guy kind of rewarding. Have you guys ever wor worked or known people who've worked for a boss like this? Did they have fun? <laughs> Did they dread going to work? They feel like a sickening feeling in the stomach? Kind of like what you might feel with a lion. <laughs> Whereas if you have a great boss, have you ever worked for a really great boss? Felt motivated, energized. So that's basically the underlying framework of the model, is that there is a distinct overlap between the biology of primary survival needs and our social needs. The same parts of the brain that are implicated in physical pain are the same ones that are implicated in social pain. So these are parts of the brain that are involved with managing pain and also regulating the response to that pain on this side. So when people say that hurts, they actually literally mean it. You're literally experiencing pain inside your body when you feel rejected. They've actually shown, too, that if you take Tylenol, it actually relieves social rejection. So you can start to think about, like, if you're at work and you're feeling excluded or not welcome, how are you feeling? Just start, kind of start thinking about that. So this is what's called kind of the pain and reward network. And basically they're showing that the very same regions of the brain that are involved or implicated in physical pain are also implicated in things like social exclusion, bereavement, being treated unfairly, and negative social comparison. And we'll go a little bit more into that in the SCARF model. And then for the reward ne network, physical pleasure, like eating food, also implicated in having a good reputation, being treated fairly feels rewarding, cooperating feels rewarding, and even giving to charity activates neural networks. So now we're getting into the five domains of the SCARF model that indicate areas where we feel both threatened and rewarded. The first is status, which is defined as relative importance to others. It's our perception of our relative importance to others. Certainty has to do with predicting the future. Autonomy is a sense of control over events. Relatedness is a sense of safety that we feel with others. And then fairness is a perception of fair exchanges. So status. A lot of times organizations are kind of set up quite hierarchical, right? So you have these power structures with somebody on top and then reporting lines. So a boss is innately, or a manager or leader, is innately in a position of status. 
So some of the interesting research on status, some of it is kind of depressing, actually. Because when you're in a small group, and if you perceive that your status is lower than the people around you, your IQ literally drops, right? Like you become less intelligent. Maybe that's why people freeze up around people of really high status, you know? I felt really dumb around that person. It seems like your IQ may have actually lowered. And there's decreased uh, prefrontal cortex activity, which has to do with the higher cognitive functions that we have, like complex problem solving, decision making, things like that. So comparing yourself to another elicits a threat response. It's literally threatening to you. Research also shows that the same reward circuitry that gets activated when we receive money also gets equally activated when we perceive that our reputation with a group of people has increased. That's rewarding. So when people are in positions of, when they perceive they're in positions of power, they are automatically more inclined to engage in what's called a approach behavior. It's motivating. So certainty has to do with just the way the brain operates. It's a pattern recognizing machine and it's constantly trying to predict the future. When the brain detects an error, it kind of go, it literally goes into like error mode. So you can get distracted. So let's say you're talking to somebody and you're not sure if their actions are sort of off, an alarm bell kind of goes off. Research has shown that increased ambiguity decreases activity in the reward parts of your brain and increases the threat response. Uncertainty is threatening. We perceive it as a threat. Uncertainty has been shown to be innately rewarding. If you think about music, that's the example that's often used. It's innately rewarding because it has simple repeating patterns. That's why we like it. We can predict. Again, research also shows that during an expectation of a reward, increase in the reward network. And even, interestingly enough, in the anticipation of information about a reward. Autonomy. I think a great example of an autonomy, my, my nephew was at a dinner table, and my older brother, he was eating ice cream. You know, two years old. They are trying to just get a little ice cream in that spoon. And my brother was trying to help him get more ice cream, more ice cream. And he didn't want any of it. He was just pushing him away, like, get away from me. I want to do it myself. He was much more rewarded by doing it himself. And so that's how we function. We like to do it ourselves. <laughs> so it has to do with exerting control and having choice. You know, it's fascinating that sense of autonomy better predicts well-being than economic prosperity. When it comes to stress, if we perceive that we can escape the stress, we are significantly less impacted by it from a physical and mental level than if we perceive it as inescapable. And an anticipation of a choice increases reward. And when people lack power, which of course we do in organizations, we usually report to others, we seek out choice. Relatedness. So literally friend or foe activates again this primary network, of course, of threat or, or reward. So friend is safe, foe threatening. So when you meet a stranger, they're threatening. Your threat response system is on alert. It's kind of, maybe not highly activated, but it's kind of there. Even just shaking your hand and me getting to know your name deactivates the threat response. And what's interesting is that providing even minimal social links increases performance. It shows how important it is for us to feel safe around others. And when there's greater trust, we increase collaboration and information sharing. It's when we trust the people we work with, we feel comfortable with them, we're more willing to collaborate. And then maybe a lot of you have heard about the in-group preference and out-group bias. So in-group preference is that we have a bias towards those people who are similar to us and look like us, think like us. And the out-group bias is that we feel less empathy towards people who are dissimilar to us. Now at first, that sounds really depressing, right? When you think about racial or gender or ethnic uh, relationships. But they've actually shown that you can artificially create a sense of a group. So people who were put in, together in a group, randomly assigned, all different backgrounds, and then they were set to, you know, create an assignment and work together on a project, they reported, and they showed literally increased activity in positive networks of their brain towards their group. 
fairness is about the perception of fair exchanges, which is something that we are conditioned in, right, through our experiences with others. So we are really hardwired around the concept of fairness. And hopefully you can imagine how this knowing this model, having a framework of it, can be helpful in, in kind of a predictive capacity, right? So as a manager or an organization, you can be thinking, well, we're going to introduce this change. How might that be a source of threat for people? And what areas will they feel threatened by this? And then try to modify or anticipate that and make changes accordingly. As far as emotion regulation is another aspect of the model. So when we go into a threat mode, our brain goes offline. You lose access to those higher thinking parts of your brain that are involved with complex problem solving, decision making, um, creativity, all those things that you want people to have online when they're at work. But when we're in threat mode, there's kind of like we lose access to that part of our brain. And so when you're at work and you can identify the emotion, you're feeling activated, and you've just learned about this thing called the scarf model, and you look at it and you're like, oh, why am I feeling threatened? Why am I agitated? Oh, is it, is, oh, I don't, I don't feel valued. My relative importance to others is feeling threatened. So just being able to identify the source of your agitation it's called labeling, and that actually calms down the emotional response system, right? So that part of the amygdala gets activated. Just being able to identify that is actually helpful in calming you down, just at a basic level. So then you can start of kind of get your brain back online and start thinking maybe a little bit more about well, how do I want to approach this? Maybe you want to get creative problem solving back in. The other part is something called reappraising. Reappraising can occur until you label. So you have to label. You first have to identify the feeling, the agitation, what that's about before you can do what's called reappraising, which is maybe you're thinking, so maybe you were at a meeting and a colleague attacked your idea Later on, maybe you know, once you get familiar with the model, you can identify it in the moment. But usually it's after the fact. You identify that you felt threatened. Your status felt threatened. And then once you, you can think about, OK, well, what was my colleague feeling? Was, there, was something threatened for them? You can look at the model from that perspective as well. Maybe you know your colleague's been having a really tough time at home. Maybe they were in a bad mood. Or maybe they're feeling threatened by something. What is that? So that might cause you to like re-examine the situation and maybe forgive your colleague or, or maybe you want to have a conversation with them. Hey, what's going on? Does the same framework of the SCARF model apply for groups? As relationships between people, what might, what's not working or what's not working for the team? Okay. What's being threatened for the team? So it's multi-leveled. Multi okay. So you can think about it from, an in, that's what I like about it. It's individual but also like if you're a manager of a group of people, you could be thinking about why isn't the team working well together? But then you'd kind of have to look at maybe the individual, right. the individual dynamics, but from the lens of the SCARF model with each person. Okay.